Okay, it's working finally. I'm very happy to be here. That's my uh, second time in Sweden. And I loved it. I love the city. I've been designing games for about 20 years, and when I was when I start to work on a traditional game, I mean a game which is not uh, free-to-play games, I always follow, I would say, like a linear pattern of thought, and I guess this is what all game designers do. First, I start on the game concept, you know, it's very high-level design. When I'm happy with it, then I go to the detail, I work on the, the game mechanics, you know, the game system. Then, once this is done, I start on level design, and then I finish, you know, by tutorials and so on. And of course, there's no more marketing and so on. That's why I used to work on traditional games. And then, most recently, I've been working on free-to-play games, and then I realized, well, it doesn't work. This way of working just doesn't work for one reason, is that... How does it work? Yes. Is that even at the concept stage, I have to take into account so many parameters. I have to take everything in account. I just cannot simply tackle design issue one by one. I have to think of everything at once. And this is why I devised a method which helps me guide my thought. And this is the method I'm going to introduce to you today. So the, the bad news is that I've got a lot to say and uh, I've got only 25 minutes, so I'll never be able to say everything I have to say. The good news is that uh, my presentation will be available on SlideShare. So I will send the link, I will send the link to uh, Per Backlund and he will share it with you. I'm also going to introduce myself briefly. So my name is Pascal Luban. I'm a game designer. I'm freelance. I've been uh, freelance for about 20 years. Uh, essentially, I worked a lot on the AAA titles console. You know, I work on two Splinter Cells. I even work for Dice on Battlefield Bad Company. I did some consulting for them. More recently, I worked a lot on mobile games because that's what the market now is demanding. I still do some console games, but obviously much less. So, let's go on. Five steps in my method. First one, first step is what you guys do on any game. First, you have to define your gameplay intention, what you want your game to offer, and also you have to define your target. So, so far, it's exactly like for any other games. Then, step two, that's when things get different. Step two is to work on the monetization strategy. Now, if there's one slide I would like you to remember from this presentation is the following one. The monetization strategy is a cornerstone of any, of any free-to-play games. This is something that must be addressed very, very on. Actually, your, build sh your game should be built around your monetization strategy. I do a lot of consulting for publishers and studios who come to me and say, hey, we've got this game now, we want to monetize it. How do we do it? It's a mistake. It's always possible to, to paste a monetization strategy on an existing game, but it's not very good. The best way is to plan ahead and think very early on, OK, here's my game, here's the kind of gameplay intention I have, here's the kind of gameplay experience I want to give my players, how am I going to make money out of it? So this is why thinking of the monetization strategy is something that you should address very, very, very early on. Now, of course, we have to decide, OK, What's a monetization strategy? Actually, it's not what you sell. Many people believe that the monetization strategy is the products you sell, the, you know, the items you sell in the game. They say, well, we're going to sell cosmetic items, or we're going to sell energy points, and that's my monetization strategy. No, it's not. What is really the monetization strategy is not what you sell, but how you are going to convince your players to buy something in a free game. This is completely different. Obviously, how is it done? That's where things get, obviously, a bit complicated. Now, many people would say, well, in free-to-play games, they make money by selling frustration. You know, they make frustrating game. It is true that you find frustrations in many freemium games. Some games, they limit your actions. You know, it's like in, uh, you know, this game, CRC Racing. It's a racing game. You've got a limited number of uh, fuel points. To do a race, you have to spend one point. When you're out of points, you can't play anymore. Okay. Another technique which is also used to create frustration is just to, you, uh, you let people play as much as you want, but some actions take a lot of time. Example, Clash of Clans, where to upgrade buildings or troops takes forever. Like in this one, you know, it's still six days left before I upgrade this tower. 
Some upgrades can take up to two weeks for one building, okay? So they really plan that. Another game, they have another third technique. You can play as much as you want. When you want to upgrade something, it's done instantaneously, but the leveling tree is made in such a way that it just the price of some of the upgrades is super high. This is an example for World of Tanks. I just took one sub-branch of their progression tree. It's for the light French tanks. Look at the price difference. The first one you can buy is just 3,800 uh, uh, 3, uh, uh, coins. And then the top one is over 2 million. So let me tell you that to buy this one, you, know, you need to play a lot. So those are techniques which are used to create frustration. And, you know, they do work. The thing is that, is frustration mandatory to make a successful free-to-play games? Well, not necessarily. That's the good news. Actually, most freemium titles use a mixed. They use another component, which I call envy. So what is envy? Basically, frustration and envy are the two sides of the same coin. They talk about the desire. The desire that you have to get something in the game. The difference between envy and frustration is the emotional response that players will have when they face the inability to get what they want. When you have envy, you want something, but you know you can have it. It's going to take me some time, but it's reachable. When you have frustration, you want something and you know it's going to be impossible or too hard or even painful to get it. That's the difference. So this is why when people say, free-to-play games, make money because they frustrate people, it's entirely true only. Actually, it's much more complex. And this is why free-to-play games, the business model, can work with any kind of games, super casual games or super hardcore games. It just doesn't matter. It's just a question of you know, making the mix between envy and frustration. So, that's just what I say. All freemium titles actually are creating a mix between those two, between envy and frustration. But of course, they do it in their own mix. I'm just going to show you two examples. First, I'll talk Candy Crush. Candy Crush, which is pretty heavy on the, on, on the frustration side. But they, stu they still have features that generate envy. What are they? Well, first of all, the completion of a puzzle, especially at the beginning when you start playing the game, and even when you play it for a good amount of time, you know? You don't feel frustration. You do the puzzle, you enjoy solving them. They become a bit more demanding. Sometimes you have to redo them, but basically, you know, it's reachable. You can do it. You enjoy solving those puzzles. This is creating envy. The envy, you know, to solve another puzzle. And then also there's the, the feature, the social feature of beating a friend's score. It's also enjoyable. And you can do it, especially if you've got many people who play the game, many friends. You know, there's always one you can beat and so on. So this is generating envy, you know, it's pretty positive. And of course, they've got this big, big feature that generates frustration is the fact that you lack uh, turns, you know, to complete uh, puzzles. At first, this is very, very weak, you know, you barely feel it. But after a while, you know, as your progress is in the game, it becomes more and more difficult and it's impossible to complete the puzzle. You're always lacking turns and so on, you, and you go mad, okay. Roll of Tank, different example, more focused on hardcore. They also have f features for both. First, uh, features that generate envy, the first one is the catalog of tanks. Now, World of Tanks has at least 200 tanks that you can buy in their, uh, in their, uh, in their shop. Uh, personally, I feel a little bit like a, like a kid in a toy store. You know, you probably remember that when you were a kid getting into a toy store all those toys everywhere and say, oh, one day I will buy them all, you know? You have this feeling of, ah, it's fantastic, you know? Exactly the same thing, the same thing here. When you start World of Tanks, you've got all those tanks, you've got the, 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 the tiger, you've got all those exotic and fancy uh, tanks and so on. You, know, you want them all and, you know, actually there's nothing that prevents you from getting them. So you have this feeling, you know, that creates envy. And then also, you've got the sweet test of victory. World of Tanks is a multiplayer game, as you know. Beating somebody is fun. You know, destroying another tank, it's fun. Winning the game is fun. So basically, this is just, you know, that's what I call the sweet test of victory. 
you want that, to enjoy that. And you know that even if you lose a game, we well, can play another one, and you've got chances of hitting another tank, maybe winning the game, and so on. But they also have features that generate frustration. First of all, the increasing price of tank. We saw that previously. At first, prices are very low, and then you know the, the prices just get very high. But also, they have a much more uh, vicious feature that people don't always know about it. It's the fact that when you reach a certain level in the game, when you play, you can actually lose in-game money. And uh, that makes it very, very frustrating. So I don't have much time to go in details, but this is very, very smart uh, design. So my point is that all the games, all the freemium games that work, have a mix of those two features. And actually, uh, sorry, I went a bit fast. I think the best one is that, uh, sorry, went a bit too fast. OK, so we saw Envy. We saw what it is. To create Envy, you have to offer a lot. This is why when you do a freemium games, you have to take the risk of offering a lot of feature, you know. Uh, and also, the player understands that if he plays the game a lot, eventually you will get what you want. This is called grinding. This is an interesting par uh, fact of freemium games. Even if you don't play very well, you can still have a hope to access you know, what you want. Of course, you will not earn as many points as a good player, but you will still earn points toward your objective. This is grinding. And then frustration, the game on purpose, you know, makes it very difficult for you or very lengthy to um, obtain something that you really want. So you need to have those two components. And there is no ideal mix. It depends on the game, the platform, your target audience, and so on. And the goal of the monetization strategy is to create this mix. OK. So I also want to go back to envy. People talk a lot about frustration, you know? And again, I want to stress that it is not the only way to generate money. Envy is very important. Why is it so important? Because envy is a driving force, is the leading force that will get players engaged in the game for weeks, months, and year. Remember what uh, the person from uh, uh, King said, retention is the key. He's absolutely right. Successful freemium games are those games that succeed in keeping the players engaged for a long, long period of time. Because experience shows that the longer you play games, the more chances eventually you will spend some money in it. So this is why we need to have very strong also uh, envy features, because those are the ones that will just keep you playing to the game. So to build your monetization strategy, you need to use monetization technique. So here we are turning into like more kind of a game design techniques. So there are main techniques that we all know about it. Resource limitation, cosmetic, advertising, leveling, and so on. I won't go in detail because I don't have much time. But again, if you get uh, the link to the, the, the presentation, you will get that. Those are techniques that everybody knows about it. But also, there are some alternative techniques that are less unknown, but I find them quite interesting because they work on the same system, they work in the same frame as free-to-play techniques, but you know they can be alternative for people who don't really want to go into in-app purchases. So those are premium, episodic content. To me, yes, this is something which is very close to the freemium business models, restricted access, and partnership. So my point is that if you are going to do a freemium games, you are not locked to those. They do work. But maybe you don't like them. Maybe your game is not adapted. Maybe your audience does not like those. So you have alternative, and that's a good news, because that means that as designers, you can really choose exactly the technique that will fit your objectives and your game. And actually, that's obviously this is like my perception. You know, somebody else might have a different perception, but all those features, you know, can put themselves differently on the on this chart. So, in other words, they all offer a different ratio between envy and uh, frustration. And actually, most successful freemium games use a mix, except here Candy Crush. All the other ones I've, I've uh, shown here are using two or three different monetization techniques 
to you know generate some revenues. So you see that monetization strategy is something which is goes very deep into the game. It's not again something that you just paste on it. It is something that goes into the, the heart of the gameplay experience you are going to create. The third step is to think about the game loops and your uh, the grinding mechanism. So what are game loops? Uh, they are also called open loops. An open loop, it's an objective and a reward. For instance, earn 100 credits and you'll be able to, to build a new farm. Typical open loop. When you play a game, when you play freemium games, and I'm sure you've all noticed that, first you always start by something like that. You have an open loop, which is very short. You complete it, and as soon as it's completed, then you've got another one, which might be a little bit longer to complete. Once it's completed, you've got more and more. Eventually, you get two open loops. In other words, at one point, you've got two objectives that you have to uh, complete. You have to make choice. You know, either you do one or the other one. Maybe you do the two at the same time, but you know, it takes more time and so on. So, and then as the game goes deeper, as you progress in the game, then you end up with uh, trees like that. Many freemium games work like that. They start by offering very short missions, short objectives, and then as you go further into the game, you've got more and more until the point where you've got so many things that you could do and you cannot do that you know, gets you into the game and could also generate some frustration. So open loops is one of the key features that you find in many freemium games. So as a summary again, an open loop, it's made of a, an objective, a reward. The player understands that he can reach the objective, that is, he can close the loop by playing the game, which is grinding. At the beginning of the game, the loops are short, but there are a lot of them. As you progress it in the game, the loops become more numerous and longer. And they are so important, and again, here we go back to retention, because at first, when you get people to discover the game, you want to keep them. So the first loops have to be short and rewarding. Why? Because on most games, they lose a lot of players on the very first day. Many people try a game and never, never come back. So we lose so many people. This is why it is so important to keep people on the first day. So the first loops, which are very short, provide short-term objectives, are designed for that, to keep people in the game and give them a reason to come back. Then you've got medium-term loops. Those are designed to get people to come back on a regular basis, maybe every day or every two days. And eventually, you get long-term loops. Those are the most important ones because those are the ones that will make the game part of your life. When you wake up in the morning and open up Clash of Clans to see what has happened during the night, that's good. Well, that means the game has become part of your life. And then, of course, you check the game 20 times a day, like myself. <laughs> uh, but the thing is that, that's what I mean, the game has become part of your life. And to reach this objective, obviously, it doesn't, doesn't happen like that. People are not going to play to connect to the game that often at first. You need, you know, to, to grow them into the game. And open loops are perfect for that. So this is why, for the retention point of view, Thinking your game around open loops is also very important. Wrong side, okay. So, open loops, as I explained, it's a prime tool to control the player's progression. Again, what you want is that you want people to enjoy the game the first day, you want them to come back on the second day, on the third one, you want to come back every day, and eventually you want them to connect to the game several times a day. Then that means the players are really into the game. It doesn't mean they are going to spend a lot of money, but at least it means that the game has become important to them. And that's what will keep people playing the game for a long time and telling their friends and so on. So this is just an example. This is taken from a game, a cartoon I worked on. So those show you know, this uh, progression curve. So the idea is that this is the number of days that people are playing. Here you've got different levels. And this is exactly what I just was explaining. At first, you know, you level up very quickly. 
So the open loops are very short. And then as the player keep playing, progresses in the game, then it's going to take him longer and longer to reach the next objective and so on. That's the kind of loop that you want to, the, the kind of progression chart you want to get in your game. Fourth step, the sharp strategy. How much time have I got? Let's see. Not much. Okay. The sharp strategy. What is that? It covers three different issues. What to sell, how to sell it, and at what price. So what to sell? There are lots of families of items. Of course, I'm not going to go into the details. My view here is that it's almost limitless. Uh, you always find the same kind of items in many games, like cosmetics, like energy points, and so on. But very often, games bring new items which are kind of specific to their gameplay, and that's interesting. So here, don't limit yourself to the traditional items that can be sold. Open up your mind and try to find new ones which are related to your own, uh, own game. This is what to sell. Now, how to sell it? Here you've got three strategies. The first one is to offer a catalog of items as wide as possible. That's an example from uh, my brute. So here, when you, like, when you go into the game, you go into the shop, you see plenty of things you can buy. Think of the toy store example I gave you earlier. And of course, you can scroll through the pages, you know, those are just the categories. They've got hundreds of items you can buy. Second category, it's the reverse, to sell as few items as possible. Like here, Rage of Bamuth, only four items you can buy. Sovereign, two items only. The benefit of this technique is that it makes the game much easier to understand. Of course, it has some side, uh, some handicaps as well, but you know, you can select one of the two. And the third technique, which is very rare, is to sell items in real money. This is what Candy Crush used to do, where you can buy, you know, in real money, this is in Euro, you know, extra lives. So this is, I think, actually, uh, they, they gave up this system. And uh, I'm not sure there are many games that do that anymore. But, you know, it's an option, especially uh, if you are targeting uh, super casual people. So, you need to select one of those three strategies for uh, your shop. And then at what price do you sell items? Here again, you've got two sets of price you have to take into account. First, you've got prices of items that you're going to sell against real money. That's how you, as a developer, you make some money. And then the second set of price are for items you buy with in-game money, which is called soft currency. Now. For the first set of prices, prices which are uh, in real money, it's pretty easy. You basically, most games do that. They offer a package. So for five euros, you are going to get like 1,000 coins and so on, you know. So this is what nearly every game does. It's pretty effective. Now you might ask why is it so effective? There are two reasons for that. The first one is that it uh, makes the purchasing act uh, less painful. You know, even if it's a small amount, it's always hard you know, to get your credit card, you know, and uh, type in the code and spend some money, you know. Uh, when you have a package of soft currency, basically you ask the player to spend money once and then he's got this fake currency, currency he can use to buy several items. So instead of asking the player to, play every, to pay every time he wants to buy something, he spends money once, and then he has some currency he can use. And the other reason also is that it makes it possible to sell items at very, very low prices, like, you know, like, like, like a quarter, for instance, something which is impossible if you were to ask the player to spend directly, in a, to buy directly with these credit cards. Uh, so that's essentially why most games are not selling items with directly with the real money. Now, what about prices? Uh, for items which are going to sell with soft currencies. Now, this is very complex. Actually, this is probably the most complex aspects of a tuning game. Um, when you work on a free-to-play games, you do the concept, you do the monetization strategy, you know, so basically you, you nail up the whole game, 
And then at one point, you have to decide, OK, I've got those items. Time is up. <laughs> I've got all those items. I need, you know, uh, to define prices. How am I going to do that? It's not simple. It's not simple because it is directly related to the pro uh, progression players. If items are not expensive enough, then people will buy them all. And then eventually, you know, all players will have the same features and so on, or will get the whole game. If it's too expensive, people just will get desperate and will not buy anything and will quit the game. So finding the right price is a bit complex. Again, I will not go into the detail uh, for that. Uh, just again, show an example of this is on, uh, on the game I worked on. It's called My GP Team. Just to show you, you know, uh, the, the graph that shows all the price points for different items that we are selling. So here you've got the price, and here you've got the levels. And these were, you know, the price points of the different items you can buy. So it is not easy to do. Uh, takes, uh, takes some time. Uh, never underestimate this part of, uh, of the design. And then the last point, and then I will stop here, it's the uh, onboarding and retention strategy. So, um, I don't know. Ah. Uh, would you like me to go to the end and skip the questions, or would you like to ask me questions and skip the end? Go to the end. All right, OK. So onboarding and retention strategy, last point. Now, onboarding, this is onboarding, it is not only the tutorial, it's a mistake. Onboarding actually regroups many things. It includes tutorial, of course, also the early rewards, the game pacing, and the level of challenge you are going to offer to the player. Onboarding is key to the success of a freemium, uh, freemium, free, free, a freemium title. To be successful for a freemium title, you need to have a good onboarding, you need to have good retention and good game. Those three things. So onboarding, I still see games today which fail because they have a pretty good game system, but the onboarding is completely crappy. So they lose all the players in the first day. So to define a good onboarding, what do you do? First of all, you have to know your target. Very important. We come back to the first step. Again, a mistake I see with many of my clients is that they want to target everybody, you know? Young, old, hardcore gamers, casual, you know, this is a mistake. You know, you really have to focus on uh, one, uh, one type of audience. Then, you also want to get the player into open loop as quickly as possible. Think of successful freemium titles. You, start, you launch the game usually just to take a look at it, okay? And you are trapped into it, you know, because you are taken by their open loops, and the more you play, the more you want to continue, and so on. This is good onboarding. Then you also want to make sure the player is not disappointed with the first minute of his game experience. And that means that everything should be high quality, including, you know, uh, even just the, the icons. You know, when you on the mobile phones, you've got the icons of the app, you know, that already says something about the game. If it's well done, if it's creative, you know, well, it's going to want you to know more about the game. If it's poorly drawn, if it's very uh, generic, you know, it gives you a bad idea about the game. So that means that every single image the player will see in the first minutes are very, very important. You know. Now, retention strategy. They're also very important because, as I explained earlier, the longer somebody plays the game, the more chances he has that he will eventually uh, spend money in the game. So why? Because the game has become part of his life. You know, it's like in my case, Clash of Clans, I connect half a dozen, well, a dozen times a day. It doesn't mean I spend money in the game. I think uh, I've been playing this game for like 15 years. Uh, no, no, not 15, three years. And in total, I spend only 15 euros, which is very little. You know, I don't need that because I enjoy the game. I'm patient. But the game is part of my life. I would not consider playing another game similar to it because, you know, I'm, I'm good in this game. I don't need anything else. Then also, Players are good at the game. When you get good at a game, somehow you know you feel comfortable with it, and you don't want to restart with another game. Because if you start with another game, you need to relearn the rule, to build up your character, your city, whatever you know. So this is not good. If you are powerful in a game, you want to stay to that, that game. And then, of course, the player will be facing many open loops. So 
if those things have been well done, then chances, chances are that you will be able to retain your player for a long period of time. Now, the best strategy you know, to create that, first of all, as my colleagues have said, just offer great games. There is no, no, uh, uh, no way around. If, you don't, if people don't enjoy the game itself, forget it. Now, there are many ways for people to enjoy the game. You know, uh, games like Cityville or Hede, you know, they have no rule gameplay. Basically, Cityville is about building your city. Hede, it's about harvesting stuff and sending it back. There's no rule gameplay, but it provides some kind of enjoyable experience to whoever plays the game. And this is valuable, this is good. To me, this is a good game. Of course, it's not targeting hardcore gamers, it's targeting a special audience, but it meets their needs for entertainment, and that's, that's good. So offer a good game. Then make it generally free. Again, this is a mistake of some publishers who force the monetization because they want to make money, and they kill the game. The game has to be really free. It's only much later on, after several months, that people will eventually spend money in the game. Don't force the monetization on them right away. And of course, see the game not as a unique, as a unique product, as a seat, as a service. That means that you are not providing an app to the players, but you are providing something that will have new content. So regularly, you need to offer them new content. You have to create events every week, every two weeks. You have to do sales also. This is very effective. And obviously, the last point, drive the player to interact with friends. Anything multiplayer is a big bonus for freemium titles. Whether it's social multiplayer, which is just like, you know, exchanging things and so on, or real multiplayer where you have to defeat opponents, no matter what you do, whatever in the game will help people interact with other players is a big, is a big plus for retention. And that's my last word. You know, have a strong multiplayer dimension. It doesn't mean it's combat. It can be cooperation, like in Hede. Uh, but whatever drives people to play together is a big plus. And that's it. I'm completed. So this will be on SlideShare. It might already be on SlideShare. If it's not, I will send the link to uh, Per, uh, who's going to share it with you. Maybe we have a few more questions. I don't know if I have time. There's nobody in the room. Yeah, the room is for ourselves. No, any question? No, no, I, okay. Uh, I'll be at the party tonight, so feel free to uh, catch me there. After three beers, I speak Swedish. <laughs> and uh, so uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Pascal. Thank you. That's a gift for you.